Gracious and loving God, may only your words be spoken, may only your words be heard. Amen. Amen. It always feels a little strange to use the microphone uh, for preaching. I feel more like Phil Donahue than uh, <laughs> ask your parents if that didn't resonate with you. As, uh, as my time with you grow, grows shorter, uh, I feel more uh, courage to preach more difficult sermons. What's the worst that you can do at this point? Right? <laughs> so today I'm going to take a great risk and preach about the Red Sox and the Yankees. <laughs> One of the great questions when it became public that I was in the running for a Bishop of Connecticut was, what was this going to mean for my sports affiliation? Uh, if you don't know, about half of Connecticut are Red Sox fans and the other half of Connecticut are Yankees fans. And so there was great concern. And I was more than a little worried that that was going to be one of the questions they asked during the meet and greet. And I was going to have to commit on the ground. They didn't. But I want to tell you, uh, in response to the gospel reading this morning, and bear with me, we'll get there, I promise. Um, can you all hear me okay? Uh, hopefully you all can as well, but it just doesn't feel like it's doing well. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a uh, uh, story of a Red Sox fan in three parts. Part one, my family and I, uh, Paul and I, uh, just traveled to Portugal uh, for an amazing vacation. Please don't tell anyone how amazing Portugal uh, is because uh, nobody goes there and that's part of what's so amazing. Uh, while we were there, you might know, and my family will tell you, that I have an uncontrollable need uh, to take pictures of people who look like they might want a picture together. So if there's a family and one member is taking the picture, or if there's a couple, I will climb across the Colosseum uh, to ask if they'd like a picture taken of them. So we were in a convent, um, and one, of, one of many, and uh, I saw a family trying to take a picture. Uh, but they couldn't take it all together. So I went up and I said, uh, can I take your picture for you? Now one of the children in the family was wearing a Yankees cap. So there was this moment of moral uh, questioning. And uh, before I could even think about it, I said to them, oh, I'm happy to take your picture. They said, oh, thank you so much. I said, if I'm going to take your picture, he'll need to take that Yankees hat off. <laughs> To which they immediately replied, oh, you're from Boston? <laughs> and I said, yes. And we sort of laughed and I walked away and I thought, that was interesting. That I felt that sort of need and maybe it was to bond about uh, this sort of fun rivalry, but um, it felt sort of interesting given um, my, uh, my depth of knowledge around all things sports in general, uh, that I was that passionate to say such a thing. That's part one. Part two, upon return, uh, some friends very generously offered uh, two tickets to uh, the Red Sox game on Wednesday night, and they were playing Tampa Bay. So it was Boston Red Sox and Tampa Bay. And um, about, we weren't doing great, I don't know if you've heard, uh, uh, although we're on a streak now. Um, see, we, well, who am I right now? Um, we weren't doing great. We were down a number of runs with no sign of things looking any better. And about the sixth inning, uh, there began this chant uh, in the Red Sox crowd, uh, a chant that I can't repeat uh, in church about the Yankees. And it started very small, but it grew and it grew and it grew and it was loud and passionate and kind of vulgar. And I sat there thinking, okay, I'm hearing that chant about the Yankees who aren't at Fenway <laughs> currently. And I'm looking at the scoreboard at how our team is doing. 
And then I'm looking at where the rankings on the scoreboard are, and I see that that team that is being jeered is actually in first place by about 14 games. So my initial reaction was, um, I'm not so sure they do what you're chanting. Um, and isn't it interesting that that's where we go at this moment? That's part two. Part three, I'm on the green line coming home yesterday, and uh, it's about game time, and now we are actually playing that team, and people are coming, I'm at Kenmore, of, you know, rookie mistake, uh, waiting for a green line train at Kenmore Station on game day, uh, but there I am, and all of these Red Sox and Yankees fans are coming off their trains, and I just thought, isn't that amazing? Like, isn't, isn't there even like a little bit of an act of courage uh, for those Yankee fans to be donning their caps uh, and their shirts in public of all places uh, at Kenmore Station. And there was this gentleman who I assume was a Yankees fan because he was wearing a Yankees hat uh, and a Yankees t-shirt and uh, he was looking at the map and again because I have this compulsion to help people who have given no sign whatsoever that they need or want my help um, I go up to him and I say, oh, do you need directions? And he said, oh, no, 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 I'm just waiting for the rest of my family. And I said, okay, well, great, have a good game. And I walked away. And what I noticed was how proud of myself I felt that I had gone over to a Yankee fan and offered directions uh, whether or not they were needed. What does any of this have to do with the gospel? It seems like a light-hearted example to be given when talking about the work of, of the gospel and the work of God's dream for the world. But where I really see the connection is that so often when we hear the parable of the Good Samaritan, we all spend a lot of time and energy trying to figure out who of the people walking on the road we are, right? That's what we do with parables. We try and figure out who in the parable we are. Our, uh, prodigal son. Are we the prodigal son? Are we the older son? Are we the parent? Who are we? So in this, are we the priest or the Levite who walked by? Are we the Samaritan? Are we the one in the ditch? And of course, if you've heard me preach about parables, you know that I believe that in parables, we are meant to wonder how each one of the people in the parable is present in us. We are each one of those people whenever there's a parable in scripture. This time when I heard the gospel, the person who caught my attention was not the priest, wasn't the Levite, wasn't the Samaritan, and it wasn't the guy or the, the woman in the ditch. It was the lawyer who stood up and asked the question, who is my neighbor? And what that question speaks to me is our compulsion as a society and a compulsion as a people of humanity to wonder who we have permission to hate. I think in this part of the world, in Brookline, Massachusetts, in New England, we can get very comfortable understanding that our question of who God calls us to love knows no end. The answer to who God asks us to love knows no boundaries. We are called to help the meek and the lowly and those without any helper, the poor, the suffering, those in prison. We know that. We feel called to that. We do that work. But I think more often than we'd like, if we are truly honest with ourselves, a companion question to who we want God to give us permission to love is who God might give us permission to hate. Who don't we have to feel compassion for? Who might God let us off the hook of tending to and helping and binding a wound, fixing a cut, finding shelter? That chant in the fifth or the sixth inning, that had nothing to do with the people who embody those uniforms. That has something to do with this amazing sort of community collective target. 
When all else fails, when the runs are not coming in, and our team is not doing well, we didn't yell at our team to do better. We didn't even scream at our team words of encouragement. Imagine, you can do it as a chant at Fenway Park. Instead, we invoked this spirit of communal dislike on a third party who weren't even present in the room to do anything with that information. I think if we think, we stop and we think about the way that we move through the world, that question the lawyer has about who is my neighbor, it might surprise us that what we ask in our lives isn't so much, God, who are you calling me to love? I think we do a good job talking about that. I think the other side of that question is, God, who do I not have to love? Who is it okay that I, I can harbor feelings of hate and disdain and contempt and unworthiness of my compassion and my love? And I know that I have those people in my own journey. Those people that I would prefer God say, oh, no, 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 Jeff, don't worry about them. You don't have to love them. That's not in your job description, right? As the expression goes, not my circus, not my monkeys. What Jesus does in reply to the lawyer's question is to say, let me give you two polar extreme opposites of people you might be thinking about. And I want you to think about that parable from both perspectives. I think we're, often our reaction is to think, oh, look, it was the Samaritan, the person we, we never have guessed would have done something as compassionate as that. But think about it from the perspective of the person in the ditch. Who would ha have been, you, who would you be surprised to see cross the road to help you? Who are you convinced is so different from you, so uh, disapproving of you, so angry or dismissive that you could never imagine them crossing a road to help you and tend your wounds. And that's the person Jesus has to do it. And then from the Samaritan's perspective, who could you imagine coming upon on the road, in need, and never imagine yourself helping? Who's the person on the other side of the road that you look at and say, not my problem. They got what they deserved. They got what they needed. Let somebody else deal with them. And that's the person Jesus has the Samaritan help. And that's the person that Jesus has the Samaritan go to. In our world, we have to ask ourselves, who are we trying to get permission not to love? And it might sound like, not me, Lord, right? But can you imagine yourself reaching out and extending an act of mercy to the very person or people you imagine you being on the exact opposite side of an issue or a topic, or a cause, or an idea, or a belief? Who is it that we, even in this community, this beloved community of St. Paul's, who is our other? That we want permission so much from Jesus to not have to worry about, to not have to extend grace to, to not have to see as beloved children of God made in the image of God. It is easy to love the people who we know would love us in return. But that's not the gospel. That's economics. The people that Jesus calls us to lo love, the people that Jesus calls to be neighbor to us, are the very people we want so much to feel okay walking by on the road. 
So back to the story of the Red Sox fan. How would those interactions have been different? And I know, again, it sounds like a trivial thing, but every time we chant, every time we poke fun, every time we make light, these are all how the foundation of disconnection are built. Right? These are the little ways we tell each other, you don't have to worry about them. You don't have to love them. You don't have to care about them. And people are listening. I want to say one word to you as, again, our time draws closer, what I want for you in your next endeavor. It is a time where the world needs to hear the voices of Christians who know the call to love all of God's children. This is not the time for us to step back and be more interested with distancing ourselves with people we disagree with than claiming our voice in the middle of the discussion. If we do not make God's love known for all of God's children everywhere under every circumstance, we will lose our ability to talk about God's love at all. I think that's the call to Jesus that Jesus makes to his followers in this parable. As he's equipping them to figure out the work ahead, he says, there is no one you don't get to love. There is no one you are not responsible to show mercy. No one. Amen.